Good morning and welcome to the six o'clock. No, Ireland, Ireland AM. It's Ireland. It's AM. Ireland. It's she's Ireland AM. Spend a week on holiday. She doesn't even know what show she's doing. Not the six o'clock show. It is Ireland AM on Virgin Media One. It is Monday, October the seventeenth. It's a windy one out there. If you're flying a kite, she's up early. Uh, <laughs> the western half of the country was hit by torrential rains and winds over the weekend. Uh, Cork has been the worst affected. We'll have the very latest on the weather front for you shortly. We did. You know what? I was, I was on a flight. You know the way I was away. Oh, did you, did you have the? Away. There was a lot of turbulence. Good crack. A lot of, oh God, what's going on here? I need another drink. Sorry, could I? Sorry, hi. Oh, oh no. no. I guess another. Uh, coming up after eight, we'll be talking to Jeffrey Archer, yes, the former Conservative politician who has lived quite the colourful life. He'll be telling us about his new best selling thriller. And the In Bruges team. In Bruges. Are, in Bruges. In Bruges. Bruges. Uh, we'll be F in Bruges. There's no F in Bruges. No. Uh, we'll be hearing from two of our finest acting exports. Do you want me to move? Uh, I want them to see them. Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. We'll be chatting to them about the Banshees, their new movie, The Banshees of Inish Such charming, charming fellas. Now he's one of the masters of musical theatre. Michael Ball will be here to chat about writing his debut novel, which looks at the rivalry behind the stage curtain. Could be a biography about his days. You know, with Andrew Lloyd Webber, all that yeah. kind of stuff. A, yeah, a ca catty shenanigans behind the scenes. We'll get a glimpse of that. Uh, and a yellow wind warning is still in place for some western counties. This more blustery in most uh, areas this morning. How are we looking weather-wise for the day ahead? Derek, there you are. Yeah. Yes, Ray. Well, it certainly was a washout of a weekend. As you mentioned there, Cork bearing the brunt of all that heavy rain. In fact, we had plenty of spot flooding through uh, Cork City into the South Circular Link Road into Cove. Also, Bannacolic, so over an inch of rain, 30 millimetres uh, yesterday. Now, it looks like the worst of the rain has passed across the country. Still very blustery. That status yellow wind warning, uh, Ray, as you mentioned, still in place for those nine Atlantic coastal counties until 12 o'clock later, uh, later on this afternoon. So we'll have more on that over the next couple of hours, plus a trip to the postal sorting office just over my shoulder to check out the brand new digital stamp. Oh my God. God. Happy Monday. <laughs> <laughs> He's been looking forward to it all weekend. He hasn't slept all weekend. I, it's like Bosco's door. But it is. I used to work in the sorting office in Limerick at Christmas time. It was like triple pay. All the Amazing. Sorry. We're going to be bringing back memories. Tomorrow. It's just going to be a minute. The sorting office. There's a crew of us. Uh, now it's time to go over for the first time uh, today. Say good morning to Cleona Russell in the Virgin Media News Hub. Thanks, Murin. Good morning. The Simon community has recorded the lowest number of rental properties available since it started collecting data seven years ago. The charity found that just 35 HAP properties were available to rent in September and over the three days surveyed, only 392 properties were available at any price in 16 areas nationwide. This is a decrease of 40% from the 657 properties available to rent in June 22 and a 62% drop from the 1,017 properties available in September 21. Cork has been hit with flooding in a number of areas over the weekend, including the South Link Road seen here. It comes as a status yellow wind warning is in place across a number of counties until midday. The warning came into effect for Cork, Kerry, Limerick, Clare, Donegal, Galway, Leitrim, Mayo and Sligo at 5 o'clock yesterday evening. Winds of up to 110 kilometres per hour are expected, with Met Erin saying it could cause disruption. Taoiseach Miha Martin is travelling to Belfast today where he's due to meet with leaders of the five main parties in Northern Ireland. It comes as the October 28th deadline for restoring the Stormont executive looms before legislation compels an assembly election to be called. There are no plans at present to extend the rollout of the second COVID booster jab to those aged under 50, according to the Taoiseach. Speaking yesterday afternoon, Michal Martin says it's a matter for the National Immunisation Advisory Committee to decide on the rollout. But he says there are no indications the vaccination programme will be extended at this time. But at the moment, uh, there's no indication that that will extend to younger age cohorts. Um, given the nature of, of, of COVID right now and at the stage it is at, the degree of protection that a lot of people have. But that's a matter for the National Immunisation Advisory Committee ultimately to make recommendations in respect of, of uh, any further extension um, of vaccination into younger age cohorts. 
From today, parking fees are being introduced at a Liffey Valley shopping centre in Dublin, including for staff. Ahead of the changes, dozens of workers gathered outside the shopping centre yesterday to protest against the fees. The management of the shopping centre says it's complying with government in shifting towards sustainable transport and say they've introduced a discount rate of €2.50 a day for staff, but some workers fear there won't be enough spaces. Like it's a minimum 600 a year, but it could be up to 3,000, you know what I mean? And like we just can't afford to pay that. And they're not meeting us halfway, they're not even giving us definite spaces. So even if we arrive to work on a split shift, you know, we're paying for a service and we're not guaranteed a spot to come into work. Four people died and 61 others were injured in Iran following a large fire at a prison used to house anti-government and political prisoners. Tensions remain high in the country this morning as protests sparked by the death of a 22-year-old woman in custody entered their fifth week. A huge fire at a prison in Iran's capital, Tehran, this weekend, where political and anti-government prisoners are detained. It's reported gunshots were heard as the blaze ripped through the Evan prison. Officials say the fire was caused by a row between inmates in a sewing workshop. A number of people died in the fire, with dozens more injured. It's not clear if the unrest at Evan Prison is linked to national anti-government demonstrations now entering their fifth week. Protesters have been on the streets of Iranian cities and at universities in recent days. The protests were sparked by the death of 22-year-old Masha Amini in police custody and appear to be gaining in momentum and spreading across the country. Marie Malkahi, Virgin Media News. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the Quote Devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you, Cleona, and a very good morning to you at home or if you're indeed streaming online on the player. We're coming to you live here from Knock Mitten in Dublin 12. Just over my shoulder, actually, we're down here at the Dublin Mail Centre because we're off to check out Ireland's first ever digital stamp. So that's all to come right across the morning. Anyway, let's take an opening look at weather together now with Mark Armstrong on cameras and following all that wind and indeed all that rain we'd had uh, yesterday. In fact, plenty of uh, the wet stuff still falling through parts to the west into Cork, Kerry, Galway, up around Donegal and into County Tyrone and really all eyes on those winds once again. They are fresh to strong, locally gusty. In fact, that status yet a wind warning remaining in place for those nine Atlantic coastal counties including Cork, Kerry into Clare, Limerick, Galway, Mayo, Sligo, Leitrim and into County Donegal. We're still seeing gusts there of about 90 to 110 kilometres per hour. So if you are making an early trip on the roads, be very, very careful because the crosswinds are quite strong and that warning remaining in place until 12 o'clock this afternoon. Now, right across today, in fact, as those shares clear in a northerly direction, we're going to see an improving day in terms of that rain. So nice bright spells pulling through. Still a little bit on the windy side, but they will taper off towards the back end of the day. Top temperatures of about 12 to 15. And finally then tonight, it looks like it will be a mainly drier one in store. We could see a little touch of mist and a touch of frost as well because it will be quite a cold night as valleys head back towards freezing to 5 degrees. So that's how we're shaping up here in Knock Mitten, Dublin 12 at the moment. We'll catch again back live, quite windy out there at 7.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. As you heard Derek talking about there, the weather has been a bit mad all over the country. It's obviously very bad in Cork where the flooding is. If you want to send us in any pictures about what's going on, we'd love to hear from you this morning and we hope everyone is safe. It's 89 6 111 We're going to be talking about that and also the Taoiseach's visit to Northern Ireland. We're back after the break with everything making your newspapers this morning. We'll talk to you after this. Welcome back. Now, the western half of the country was battered by torrential showers over the weekend with the numerous reports of flooding around Cork. Joining us with that story and everything else making the papers is the Irish independence, Ellen Coyne. Ellen, good morning. Thanks good for morning. joining us. Uh, let's start with um, the, the flooding in particular in Cork. 
Um, but although there has been treacherous conditions all over the country this morning. Also. Yeah, I mean, anyone who was on social media last night could see from about half five yesterday, there was videos of biblical rain hitting Cork and very quickly it turned into floods in some areas. We know that I think over 1,200 people in Middleton had lost power. And this morning is going to be very difficult for a lot of those homes and particularly those businesses. Like some of the videos, you can see beer kegs roaming down the street, what looks like a lake inside some people's kind of homes and businesses. So I know it'll be pretty particularly difficult um, for people in Cork. And anytime we do have adverse weather conditions, which seem to be increasing, unfortunately, it is areas like Cork that, that tend to get the brunt of it. So I think a lot of people will be asking, you know, coming into this time of year, were the council doing enough? Were all of the drains being yeah. uh, cleared properly? All of that sort of thing. But very, very difficult for people who'll be putting in really difficult insurance claims this morning. You can set your watch by it at this stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. you Cork, can. Not just Cork, Cork City is, is, is in this case, but... Uh, the whole county, North Cork in particular as well, bears the brunt of this time and time and time again. Yeah, it's, I suppose it's always that side of the country that tends to kind mm -hmm. of get hit the yeah. worst. Um, and, you know, if we're fortunate enough to not be able to relate to it, you know, we're in a, a very lucky position because this is like, it's a calendar event yeah. for some of these businesses who happen to be in kind of unfortunate places. And I suppose we talk about these weather events in isolation when they happen, but it's probably part of a broader conversation now about like our climate action plan. You know, should we have more trees, less concrete and kind of built up areas? And would that make a, a huge difference to people? And the drainage systems that we have in new estates when it's like exactly. okay there we go there's no drainage here but we're just going to give planning permission and get like this exactly. all has to be looked at it's all important um if it's been and we know that um there is uh, a status yellow wind warning in effect for uh, many counties along the western coast as well if uh, you've been affected we'd love to hear from you this morning we hope that everyone's doing okay it's a white nine six triple one triple one now we're going to move on to the next story which is Michael martin is going up North. He's up north to talk about how are you lads? Are you going to get Stormont up and running at any time soon? But they're saying that political leaders are all going to want to talk. Well, certainly the DUP and the UUP want to talk yeah, about not the all of Irish. Them. No, not all of them. <laughs> not all of them. But uh, half of them. Want to talk about the Irish football team and the ch I thought this was all I was on holiday I thought this would I can't believe this is still going on I know it's it's really unfortunate because I think when the story happened I think everyone acknowledged that the team apologised so quickly so swiftly and there was no caveats on the apology they were saying you know we messed up let's kind of move on and I think what happened was it was probably just an example of the Streisand effect and people blagarding and that video went viral over the weekend of people singing the same song in Dublin airport. Yeah. And it's caused a lot of controversy. And obviously, you know, unionist politicians are not a fan of it. But we've also had politicians down here from Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael kind of saying they want to pursue this idea of a shared island, which might eventually lead to United Ireland. And they feel that this is really unhelpful. But I suppose, as you said, you know, Micheál Martin had planned to go to the north today to have a discussion about something that I would argue is more important. And um, if this is kind of derailed, and I think if this story is given more oxygen like you're probably going to see more people singing it like the song this shot the straight thing. into the charts it, it just yeah. self perpetuates exactly we saw the, the images yeah. there from Dublin airport a minute ago and I, I explain what was the effect you, you described first the there? Streisand effect Which so is... it's uh, based on a story where Barbara Streisand tried to suppress something and the idea is that when you try to forbid or suppress something or tell people that they can't do it the natural human reaction is to pay more attention right. to it or yeah. to do it more so like after so the story so here we are now broke, 21 minutes past exactly, seven on exactly. national television and like the, <laughs> a lot of people started streaming the song it came back into the iTunes chart into the charts like, like it's and I think it, it is very unfortunate because obviously you know some people would say that they grew up with this song they would have heard it at house parties there was no malice intended but other people make the argument that in much the same way that we might find songs like Rule Britannia offensive have we ever other listened to the offensive. national anthem it's kind of our national anthem is pretty violent it's and gory pretty and deep. Deep. yeah you yeah. know what I mean and then we had what happened during the summer with at an Orange Order event whereby they sang songs about a recently murdered woman, Michaela Macarivi, a song that had just been made up and they all knew the words to it. I know that this is a, a historical song. I know it's only 1987. I can't believe this is still going on and they, they've got no health budget in Northern Ireland and this is what they want to talk about. Well, I suppose, yeah, like you're, you're talking about the, the Streisand's effect, I suppose that the matter is then to, to, to let it play out, it'll play out and there'll be exactly. something else to be outraged exactly. over yeah. um, in another week there or we two. There we go. Um, the, the counties with the most hazardous pathways and highest rates of personal injury claims, when you consider that uh, people can't afford to heat their homes and there aren't enough houses being built for people, when you consider there are tens and tens and tens of millions, hundreds of millions being spent on these sorts of claims, 
Uh, tell us a little bit about this. Yes, yeah, so it's a story in the Irish Independent showing that councils have paid out more than 150 million euro in compensation to about 10,000 people who put in personal injury claims since 2017 for uh, injuries that they would have sustained on crap footpaths, basically. So uh, it's named individual councils. So Dublin, Limerick, Waterford, Louth and Tipperary had the highest number of claims and County Longford had the highest number of claims per capita. And I think if you're fortunate enough to have never fallen over or fortunate enough to be able-bodied, nothing will radicalise you against the state of pavements in this country, like trying to navigate a pram mm -hmm. around them. Absolutely. I mean, they really are desperate. And as you pointed out, you know, the, all the ways that this money could be better spent. But even before you talk about um, those kind of virtues, like helping people with their heat, if they spent 150 million euro in compensation, people are kind of arguing, could you not have used that money to just improve the footpaths just make in the better first place? Exactly. Yeah. 50 million exactly. Foot but this is the thing, 150 million euro is mind-boggling money. It's humongous money for what most people would rightly consider to be basic infrastructure uh -huh. that you yeah. should have, that um, you know the public funds that these councils have should go towards anyway, and that the maintenance of that should be something, it should be one of the basic things that yeah. a council does. Uh -huh. And particularly when you're talking about areas like Dublin city centre that have high volumes of, uh, of traffic, um, it's very unfair for anyone who does have mobility issues, older people who might not be able to, to get around the very National easily. The National Council of the Blind have been talking about this for how long? Exactly. And that's when... before you consider people parking on footsteps, yeah. all of those, those sorts of uh, objects that get in the way. I mean, it's uh, it's it's one that will enrage people. There will be some people who will be pointing towards you know claims culture and you know that m m many of these. But, but then you walk on a footpath and you're like, lads, they're digging up roads. There's for not pipes. much defence for it. Yeah. And then no. they put down this as this this the black asphalt that you're like, that, well, no one can handle anything like yeah, that. If you're able body, you're fine. But as you mentioned, if you're in a wheelchair or a pram, exactly. It, they're just, yeah, it's pretty bad. You know what to do. If you want to send in pictures uh, of the on. bad ones. We start, talk to Joe. <laughs> talk to Joe. Is that it? 0896 <laughs> oh, <nine, six>, <laughs> if you want to go out, if you want to go out in the weather and show us the state of the potholes on your footpath, you can absolutely and utterly do that. Uh, there was another story in the news that we saw there, and this is in relation to Liffey Valley Shopping Centre in Dublin. So they have decided to start charging for parking because they're trying to encourage people to get out of their cars. Right. Because you know when you go to a big shopping centre where they don't want you... Well, the Liffey Valley Shopping Centre isn't near anywhere. Exactly. No, exactly. <laughs> this is the thing. And also it's... So we're going to walk there, are we? It's we want you to buy as many things as you possibly can and then carry them on the no public transport. Fair enough. So when you're doing yeah. your weekly shop, bring it on public transport, lads. So it takes about two buses to get there for most people. If you're lucky, yeah. If you're lucky. And there's two motorways. It's surrounded by motorway. So you can't really get there on public transport, no rail. And they're going to charge staff to park there. Yeah, I think it's staff really, like I mean it's annoying for shoppers but it's infuriating for staff and I think if we're going to talk about these kind of climate measures, there's plenty of big fancy shopping centres in the city centre who might let go of their chokehold on uh, car parking and maybe let us start oh, yeah. pedestrianising streets in the middle before we start with shopping centres kind of way out on the outskirts of the city that already have had the car park built. <laughs> like the car park's there already mm -hmm. so... It's there, well, you know, do, do you buy what they're saying I suppose as well? But, you know, it's a revenue stream for an awful lot of people who'll be going there. You're going to a car park, you've gotten... It's taking people away from a city centre. City centres are dying. And it's like, lads, it's a shot. You're trying to get people to buy 75 bags yeah. worth of stuff. They need to bring their car. Well, it might disincentivise shoppers and certainly the staff are up on arms because they're saying it could, could cost them up to 600 euro a year. That's an unbelievable financial penalty to put on yeah. people who are trying to go to work. work. I mean, if any of the rest of us were being charged that by our employers, we wouldn't have it. And I think that we know that nurses... The, the amount of times oh, that we heard hospitals, for yeah. hospital staff, oh God, porters, yeah. cleaners, mm -hmm. nurses going to work during COVID who were clamped and who were charged every single day, which is just uh, which is just crazy. We'd love to hear from you this morning on any of our stories. It's 0896 triple one triple one. I'm lashing the number out there this morning, haven't I? <laughs> Talk to Morden. It's like I've forgotten how to do it. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? One week off. Ellen Coyne from the Irish Independent. Thank you so much for joining us. Cheers, Ellen. No problem. Have a lovely day. Uh, still to come this morning, the risks around stockpiling for bonfires and misuse of fireworks. Is that time of year? It is. We're nearly there now, just a couple of weeks away. Plus, we're reviewing the weekend. You're sport. mad for this, aren't you? I'm sport crazy. <laughs> uh, sport from Liverpool's clash with Man City to the Battle of the Uniteds at Old Trafford. We'll see you back here after the break. <laughs> Now, you know you're getting closer to Halloween when you start seeing the wooden pallets start piling up somewhere in your area. We've been having an argument about wh when is 
bonfire night because different areas, different regions of the country seem to have a different yeah. nights where the stockpiling of the pallets happens. In particular in Dublin or on the east coast of the country, it seems that it's Halloween is bonfire night. And then for us, it was May Day. So like the first and for us, it was in June. It was, it was Midsummer's Night. The longest night of the year was bonfire night. Yeah. So in, in different parts of the country. But in particular, there's a particular focus on Halloween in the next couple of weeks. Of course. And here to chat about the dangers of bonfire stockpiling and Halloween safety are Councillor Dahi Doolan and Firefighter Darren O'Connor. Thank you both so much for joining us Thank this you. morning. We appreciate that. Dahi, you're from, you're originally from Cork and it was originally always... Originally from Cork, yeah. I remember a very June. happy memory of it, the, the longest night in June and going to Bonner Night as we called it and it was all good fun and very organised. But it's different now because it is, things get definitely. out of hand. It is. I mean, the thing is, I certainly don't want to be a party pooper. I want a family-friendly, fun Halloween season for everybody. Um, and I would encourage people, if they do see bonfire material being gathered, that it needs to be reported to the City Council because the City Council will coordinate with Dublin Fire Brigade and the Gardaí and remove the bonfire material. Not that we're trying to take the fun out of Halloween, but the opposite. We want to make sure our parks, the playgrounds, the football pitches aren't destroyed. With, with bonfires um, and that they can attend all the other family friendly events that we're having, we're having a concert in Inchicore, we're having uh, fun runs in the park, there's loads of activities organised across Dublin and the key thing is that we're not saying to young people that they're, they're the problem, they're not the problem, we want to work with them, young people are our resource, but usually with bonfires it's not necessarily the young people cause the trouble at the end of the night, it's when the adults arrive with their cans of drink, with their crates, their bags of drink and some of the other stuff they bring with them. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there's conflict and conflict with Dublin Fire Brigade or the Gardaí. And then it, that, that can sometimes um, terrorise some local people, the, the, the vulnerable people. That's what we don't want in Halloween. And I do think, we were talking about it outside, I do think in recent years, the number of call outs and the number of bonfires, big dangerous bonfires, has definitely diminished compared to where it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that's because of good coordination between City Council, between the Gardaí, Dublin Fire Brigade, and indeed youth services in the build up to it, keeping the young people active, keeping them entertained. John Bosco's family base in, in Ballyfarm, all doing activity with young people in the build up to it to keep them busy focused, entertained, right. and then on Halloween itself, running a whole plethora of events across Dublin, keeping people busy, keeping them right. going until about nine o'clock at night. And then you wake up the next day and everything's intact. Right. There's no threats, no violence. Uh, Darren, I'm quite surprised to hear that because every report I hear mm. around, and, and it does seem to be very much Dublin focused, is, yeah. you know, uh, fire brigades getting rocks thrown at them, uh, there being dangers around uh, bonfires, about you just going, please, lads, stop losing the run of yourselves, and then just being yeah, social it's actually media. Been a huge, it's actually been a huge uh, reduction in it. Um, in calls, uh, 2020, we did over 300 fire related calls on Halloween night, and 2021, we just under 150. So. Was that because of the pandemic, though? Yeah, are you expected more, no, it, more people I think to come in? Due to Dublin City Council as well and local councillors and, and people giving information about stockpiles, Dublin City Council removed like hundreds and hundreds of tonnes of stockpile bonfire material last year and the year before. So the ambulance calls went up for ourselves, went up last year, but that probably was due to COVID. But on the night itself, yeah, it was a massive reduction. And we'd only one incident of uh, antisocial behaviour where one fire engine sustained damage to a window. So, yeah, we've seen a huge reduction in it. And I suppose that's people uh, getting behind it, getting behind yeah. the initiative. I, I, one initiative that people have been asking for is for uh, if you if you spot stockpiling mm. occurring or, or a build up of material that's going to be burnt, is to phone it in. Yeah. So if you go to Dublin City Council website, <clears throat> excuse me, they've uh, they've the numbers of all the local authorities in Dublin, South Dublin, Fingal, Dunleary, right down. You can report the stockpiles on there, and there's actually a, an online reporting portal as well. You can report the stockpiles there. Where, where they, are people? So, sorry. I just, I'd never heard of stockpiling. Factories, yeah. they tend to use what tends Derelict to happen buildings. with outside. Empty buildings, mm. factories, they stockpile them, they'll monitor it. And when you do ring in, I would say to the public, if you do see stockpiling, report it. But the guards or the Dublin Fire Brigade or indeed Dublin City Council may not respond immediately because they will allow the stockpile to gather momentum oh. and then they will move at the last minute. The other thing, the other initiative Dublin City Council, which was very, very useful, was they provided free skip service in the, in the few days and the build up to it so people could dispose of their bonfire stuff like chairs, tables. Um, well, it, that's a big, isn't that a big tradition? Like, it, 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 as a culture, for, for, for years we've always had the thing, well, bonfire night's coming well, up. And now what yeah. we noticed yeah. was one particular um, Halloween a few years ago, we noticed that the bonfires were definitely um, uh, waning. So, but we did notice that adults were putting a lot of furniture and stuff out on, on the day and young fellows were gathered. So City Council yeah. responded, which I thought was a common sense approach, put in free skips into these communities, let them gather 
um, all the chairs and tables and taken away. This year, unfortunately, Dublin City Council have reversed that service. And I have a motion coming up um, actually at this, this Wednesday um, at my own local area committee in, in Dublin South Central looking for that decision to be reversed. I think it's a, it's a common sense approach, it's a mature approach, and it's a harm reduction approach. Supply the free skips, allow people to dump their, 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 their bonfire material in there, you take it away and dispose of it safely rather than allowing it out for idle hands to gather I'd, on the day. I'd also like to say to people that even if it's an eight-euro table from Ikea, I know friends of mine that sell those on adverts and done deal. Yeah, you can get a to few get their, like, like, a, like everything will be again. Everything will be bought and reused. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you can make money if, if you Don't want to. Don't bin it. Sort of stuff. Dispose it safely. If it is being collected, report it. But I would appeal to the City Council to please think carefully about this decision to reverse the skips. It was a, it was a big contributing factor to gathering that waste bonfire material and disposing of it yeah. safely rather right. than burning it. Or you could, you could stockpile it and then phone it in yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you can just stockpile it and sell it. <laughs> Dar Darren, it, it, this is the other thing that, people, that it, you know, every year we, we're always talking about mm. uh, injuries sustained, particularly by kids. Mm when it comes to fireworks. Yeah. Now, we, we're, we're not allowed fireworks in this country, but there's, there, there, you're, you still need to be yeah. aware of uh, the dangers that it poses. Yeah, each year, and definitely the last two years, there's definitely been two um, incidents that I'm aware of that people have sustained catastrophic injuries to their, mm -hmm. to their hands from, oh my God. from mm -hmm. exploding uh, fireworks. It does yeah. feel like if, if you are a person who lives around an area that at Halloween, I think it mm. happens every, this happens everywhere. Mm. It's the, the the week leading up to it, and now it seems mm -hmm. like two or three weeks. Yeah. The bangers, the poor since animals. August, yeah. really, it's been happening it, since it's August. Um, and again, it's adults are importing them, adults are distributing them, adults are selling them. It's the young people end up using them. But let's remember, we as adults, I'm saying, mm -hmm. we need to bear responsibility for this and to, to curtail the importation and distribution and the sale of them. And again, if people see it, please report it, because every time you report these, the guard, you get a bit of the jigsaw and they piece it together. Who's bringing them in? Who's importing them? Who's stockpiling them? Who's distributing them? And then they can make a move. And again, the last year or two, I think they've they've broken the back of a lot of this with the fireworks as well because of the, the good intelligence they're getting from the public. And Darren, I'm just wondering when it when it comes to this, because it does feel like Baghdad in the 80s sometimes, mm. you know, when uh -huh. in the leading up yeah. to this. It's, the sound is unbelievable. Poor Anna, like you just feel so bad mm. for, the, for the animals. But I, I'm just wondering, does it help when councils mm. put on fireworks displays themselves? Yeah, look, we did, the figures speak for themselves from last year for 2021. We did a, just under 150, 148 bonfire-related calls on, uh, on Halloween as opposed to over 300. So the organised events, you know, and again, we have to be practical, we have to be pragmatic with the approach. People are, are fascinated by bonfires, kids are fascinated. It's all about, you know, dressing up, going to the bonfire, seeing the fireworks. And that, that's going to happen, and it's going to take years and years to break, to break that culture. But there's a safer culture out there, you know. So okay. the organised events, obviously, with the kids being drawn away from the bomb first, they're not as popular. So we have, yeah, we've seen a, seen a reduction. That's great. Have, yeah. that's, it's worth being aware really of the local here. events in the area. Dahi and Darren, thank you so much for joining thank us you. this morning. Good to be on. Thank, thank you thank so you. much. Uh, right, up next, a look back at yesterday's Premier League action. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to Ireland AM. Uh, with over 40 years as a best-selling author, Geoffrey Archer will be here to talk about his passion for storytelling and the current Conservative Party soap opera that's going on across the water at the moment. He'll have some insight for us on that. Now it's got lots of Oscar buzz, the latest collaboration from the In Bruges. In Bruges. In Bruges. In Bruges. In Bruges team sees Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson reuniting with Martin McDonough for the Banshees of Inishir and we'll be hearing from them after nine this morning. And he shot to fame for his work with Andrew Lloyd Webber, West End star Michael Ball will be joining us to talk about reteaming with the musical maestro ever a little since, bit later on. Ever since I heard he was going to be on the show, I've been singing Love. Love changes everything. Oh, of course. You know, Michael Ball song. Such a good tune. Uh, if you're looking for a healthy option for tonight's dinner, Paul Knapp has he sorted. You're going to sing the Michael Ball song now I that you know he's going to be on? You stole my thunder, so I'm I, so no, no, sorry. No, okay, he's okay. going to do it, man. It's I was, all I was can... all swarmed up. I did my la 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 la. Oh, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I missed, I missed out on that one. What, okay. are we, what are we having today? Today we are making a simple sausage stew. Healthy, hearty, nutritious, and cheap. It's like my tagline, really. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's okay. good. My slogan. Sausage stew is your slogan. 
No, no, that's Healthy, right. hearty. Okay, fine, yeah. fine. And cheap. Sausage stew. <laughs> sausage stew is my slogan. There we go. Uh, you no longer need the hassle of licking a stamp as well when sending a letter. We've gone digital. Derek has the answer. Reveal all. How are you, sir? Yeah, we do. Come here, lads. Sausage stew, perfect weather for an out there today because it is howling a gale. Those winds still pretty pacey until 12 o'clock this afternoon. But we've come down here, right, to Dublin's mail centre. Uh, we've got loads of bills there <laughs> coming out to the post. Are you busy, Barry? Oh, flat out, Derek. Flat out. Derek, we're going to be talking all things digital. Could it be the end of the little old stamp? We'll find out more later on this morning. Right, get those bills on the get those bills on Thank the train, Thank you so Come much, on, get Derek. Them out. <laughs> we'll see you in Derek just cracking the whip at the nail centre this morning. I know he just got a job there four minutes ago. For car insurance, van insurance, or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you very much, Joe. We're live here in Knock Mitten, Dublin 12. Barry is busy getting the post up on the line here because we're live at Dublin's Mail Centre uh, right across the morning. We're going to be finding out about the brand new digital stamp. That's all to come in and around 8.45. So do hang with us for that. Anyway, we're getting past 8 o'clock together. Let's take a look at how it's shaping up. And we're all talking about that wind out there this morning, fresh to strong, locally gusty southwest, veering west. And in fact, we still have that status yellow wind warning in place for those nine counties now, including Cork, Kerry, Clare, Limerick, Galway, Mayo, True, uh, Sligo, Leitrim, and into County Donegal with mean speeds there about 50 to 65, with gusts in excess of 90 to 110. So if you are heading out and about on the school run, it's those crosswinds you need to keep an eye on out there this morning. Quite tricky, quite dangerous at times. So please do give yourself extra time and take care. Now, right across this afternoon, it looks like an improving picture because as that rain tracks in a northerly direction in behind it, we're going to see a much more settled day ahead. Brighter spells kicking through. Still quite pacey in terms of those winds as they veer southwest west um, but easing off towards the back end of the day at 12 to 15 and across then into tonight mainly dry calm and settled so a big improving picture on the cards some mist and patchy fog as well and it will be quite a cold quite a chilly night in store with values back to about freezing to five with drizzle to the southwest into your tuesday morning so that's how it's shaping up here in knock mitten dublin 12 at the moment at the mail center we catch you back live at 8:45. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Well, Derek, not give your man a hand. He's the, <laughs> the one man in the whole country keeping all the, the nation's post moving. And Derek won't give Derek's him a hand. Derek's like, no, no, no he's not paid to do that, he's not. Crack um, on there. Welcome back. It's time to take a look at this morning's papers. We're starting with the Irish Times. It's headline, planning board to get interim members. The government is preparing to make emergency appointments to the board of onboard Planala in a bid to overcome turmoil in the planning system. Revealed counties with the biggest trip and fall payouts. Councils have paid out almost 150 million euro in compensation claims relating to trips and falls on footpaths and roads in the last five and a half years. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The examiner leads with government ready to sign eviction ban. A ban on evictions will go before cabinet as early as tomorrow if Housing Minister Dara O'Brien gets the go-ahead from coalition leaders. Building of homes slowing down to a trickle is the top story on the Daily Mail. The paper reports house building is failing to meet targets, causing an absolute storm with the struggling sector expected to decline sharply next year. The mirror goes with winning streak. Lucky lotto punters are on a winning streak as the jackpot has been scooped for the third time in just 10 days. And the star leads with man grabs GAA kid by throat. Gardaí are investigating an incident in which a young boy was allegedly grabbed by the throat by an adult man during an under nines, under nines hurling blitz in County Tipperary on Saturday. And the Sun's front page, biker Trove, gangland banker Patrick Scooter Boy Lawler has hidden six of his beloved mod scooters over fears that they will be seized by Gardaí. Now, it's time to look at some of your texts. As you saw in there on the front of the Irish Independent, it's about the councils paying out over 150 million in five years around Ireland because people tripping. Lisa says, the council have a company going around my estate in Dublin at the moment, fixing paths. They are digging up perfectly good footpaths and then relaying them, but leaving broken paths in other places. It's absolutely mind boggling. Uh, yeah, we were mentioning earlier on when we were talking about the story that like 150 million euro could be spent in so many other ways, like or just spent 75 of it fixing the paths 
and then the other 75 could be spent in so, so many uh, better ways like building houses yep and, uh, a multitude of other ways um joan i fell it says i fell on a road in dublin two years ago i rang the council twice on both calls the first thing i asked was i was asked was do you want a claims form oh that's the that's the reflex do, do, do you want to make a claim both times i said no i asked them to just fix the path please <laughs> a lump of tar was just thrown on the raised cracks so it's still the same to this day. That's the thing that happens as well. The amount of, no more than with the potholes, you see them just being like, quick, get out there and just fill it in rather than actually making a long-term solution and fix it. Doing the good, doing the proper just job sort of pro rather proper than going, it. lads, it's going to be, I don't know, maybe if you work in the country, you're like, well, it's too complicated to get this done. It seems mad. Um, a message here, this is in relation to a shopping centre in Dublin. They're now charging people uh, to park in the shopping centre and they're going to be charging workers. Uh, there's a place in Dublin, Dundrum. Most people around the country will have gone to Dundrum. I forgot that they charge. Ross, I work in Dundrum Shopping Centre and they never provide parking for staff. So a lot of people in my job park in nearby housing estates and walk. I imagine this is what's going to start happening in Liffey Valley yeah. staff because that happens in our estate at home in Limerick where we're by the hospital. So all the hospital workers park in our estate. Which because you can park out in the front of people's houses or you know next to people's um, Rather than getting driveways. charged 60 quid a day. You know what I mean? Well, this is it, yeah. You've got a crazy money uh, for people just going and doing their jobs. Uh, any reaction, text? Or what's the text number? Uh, I remember this. I'm very proud of myself. It's 89 6 Triple one, triple one. There you go. You can get in contact uh, with anything that we're chatting about this morning. Uh, coming up, he sold over 300 million novels. That's a lot of reading. The Bible may have sold a few more copies, but only just. Yeah, just about that. We'll be chatting to Jeffrey Archer about his latest crime thriller after the break. Now, he's the former deputy chairman of the British Conservative Party and a number one best-selling author with over 320 million books sold worldwide. Good morning to Geoffrey Archer. How are you doing, Geoffrey? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm very happy to be on, the, on your show. It's very right, nice I... to be able to say that, isn't it? 320 million books. Like, that's nice to put on the CV. <laughs> well, my biggest break came in Ireland when Gay Byrne held up Cain and Abel when it had just come out and said, this book will go to number one all over the world. It's now on its 132nd reprint. So thank you very much, Gay. Wow. Uh, and uh, I suppose, it, uh, was it the, the case that launching in Ireland or getting good sales in Ireland allowed then other markets to go, oh, hang on, there's something here? I think what you didn't realise, or you may well have done, Ray, but what probably the Irish people didn't realise is that gay was very respected in the United States. So when I arrived, I did his show in Dublin. I then flew on to New York, and the message had already got there. That's the sort of influence he had. It's uh, Gay was the first social media. It was when he got you viral. He got you viral by the time you got over to, to New York. But Jeffrey, of course, you mentioned Cain and Abel there. That's, you know, a book full of intrigue, politically. You've written in so many different uh, genres and also factual uh, genres about your time, of course, in prison. But I suppose we have to talk to you about what's going on in the, in the current Conservative Party in the UK as someone who has been deeply uh, entrenched with that party for so many years. What, what do you make of it all? Well, no novelist could write it, Mirren. It's just unbelievable. Uh, Her Majesty the Queen appoints a prime minister on Tuesday, sadly dies on Thursday. The new uh, prime minister comes in, brings in a mini budget without consulting her cabinet, without consulting uh, the fiscal bodies. It's a disaster. She sacks her chancellor. She brings in a new chancellor who's going to report to the people this morning at 11 o'clock and then will report to Parliament this afternoon. You couldn't make it up. It is like something out of a novel. Like, it, it's absolutely incredible. Or like something out of a, a soap opera. Um, in the last... She's only in the job a wet week. And in the last couple of days, particularly over the weekend, there have been calls already for her to resign or to be replaced. How would that work, though, technically, uh, Geoffrey? Maybe you can explain uh, the, the political point, situation right? for us. It's a good point, because in theory, the 1922 committee rules state that you cannot remove a leader of the party 
within one year. So they would have to change the rules of the 1922 committee to do it. And that will take uh, a little time. But the party is so uh, worried at the moment, I wouldn't be surprised if they did change those rules and look for a new leader. And Geoffrey, looking for a new leader again, you know, from David Cameron to Theresa May, Theresa May ousted by Boris Johnson, people saying, will he come back? We've got Liz Truss now. Jeremy Hunt has gone into this job, an unpopular figure amongst an awful lot of people and saying that he's ruling. Like, is it time for a general election to let the people of Britain decide who their leader is? Because they haven't decided in a while. Well, uh, if I was the leader of the Labour Party, I would be, as he is doing, calling for a general election. But if I was the leader of the Conservative Party, it's the last thing I'd want. We're 30 points behind in the polls, and one paper this morning is suggesting we'd end up with only 70 or 80 seats. So, no, I think that is not on the cards. The only proviso I make is if they get rid of Liz Truss and she sees it coming, she might get very cross, visit the king and say, I think that we should have a general election. Uh, rather than be seen to be lose as prime minister. That, of course, would be a disaster. I can't see her doing it, but some very strange things have happened in the last two or three weeks. Yeah, it could be another chapter, another twist uh, in, the, uh, in the novel and as it plays out. You mentioned the king, actually. I, 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 have you met... I know, I know you met the queen uh, before she passed away, or several times before she passed away. Have you, have you crossed paths with Charles as well? Well... Uh, only because my wife is chairman of the Science Museum and, and he, uh, agree, he, the Science Museum is one of his uh, favourite places. No, my association, as I make clear in the new book, Next in Line, was with Princess Di Diana. I had a close association, I would dare to say, friendship with Princess Diana. Uh, and in the new book, there's an incident that happens, which you will see on the front page, says... Is this a true story? So I decided after 25 years to reveal something that may surprise my normal readers. But it was a great privilege to work with her. It was a great privilege to uh, consider her a friend. Indeed, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, in, uh, in those days, John Major, invited me to be with her on the day she withdrew from public life. Uh, and uh, when she made her famous speech about just that, uh, I was at her right-hand side and spent the day with her. And I was very touched to learn from the Prime Minister that she had chosen me to be with her on that particularly trying day. Wow. Uh, first of all, I've, I've never heard greater clickbait in my entire life, Geoffrey, <laughs> as, as what you just said about revealing something uh, that you never have before in relation to, to Diana. Fans will definitely well, want to know about that. Uh, is it true? Is, like, are you <laughs> writing? So tell us about the book. The book is based on, it's the fifth in, in your detective series. And it's based on yes, the it, royal it's family. A, it's, a William, it's a William Warwick book. And this time he's in charge. He's a superintendent. And he's in charge of royalty protection. He's risen, as you know, through the ranks from uh, a constable on the beat to sergeant to inspector, chief inspector. He's now a superintendent, each book having a different crime, so they're individual. This one is royalty protection. And I couldn't resist using uh, the knowledge I'd gained working with Princess Diana, and indeed I got in touch with her royalty protection officer, Ken Wolf, and talked him through uh, my experience and many of his experiences, and they get in the book. And I hope you'll see not a different Diana, but uh, perhaps someone you've not met before. Certainly in a position to give us an insight into what life was like for her. You can't tell us. We're going to have to read the book. I think... We're in fiction. She, she, I she, am. I'm like... You've teased us sufficiently. We're dying to know what it is you said. But you are a stickler for detail. And I suppose uh, in, in your research, you, you want to make sure that you get it absolutely right. That's why you're talking to these experts. I spend an immense amount of time on detail. Uh, each book has 14 drafts. The one you have in front of you is literally the 14th draft. And I go through a series of people before I allow anyone to read. I have the privilege of having uh, Superintendent Johnny Sutherland 
retired from the murder squad and Michel Roycroft retired from the drug squad to advise me on any mistakes I might make. There is Johnny, who uh, a very remarkable man. In fact, William Warwick is kind of based on him. Uh, he's the hero. And uh, Emma is uh, uh, based on my wife, a very strong woman. But then I've been surrounded by strong women all my life. I did, Me too. Yeah, you lucky things. You're both lucky things. And Jeffrey, in that life, you have lived. You have lived so many, you know, lives as to how you started, how you met your wife, being in the Conservative Party, uh, you know, having to go to prison, coming back out, selling so many books, getting to do the author thing, uh, alongside everything that you, that you have done. Do people spend a lot of time? Because you're 82. Which, if I was, if I looked like that, I'd be telling everyone, "How are you?" <laughs> I wouldn't be saying, "Hi, yeah, I'm Jeffrey Archer." I'd be like, "Hi, yeah, I'm eighty too." Like you're, you're going to keep on going. For you've, you've got planned loads more books, I assume. Do you? I will, I will write until I fall. He's William Warwick's currently a superintendent doing royalty protection. In the next book, he'll be a commander. In the book after, he'll be the deputy commissioner. In the book after, he'll be commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. I have no doubt that William will make commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. What I worried about is whether I'll make it to 86. <laughs> that's <laughs> well, well, fear of it, I think, now, to be honest. At the honest, rate he's going, he's probably going to make Prime Minister, um, <laughs> <laughs> given the twists and turns in the political... You're very kind. You're very kind, Ray. And if they ring me later today, I can tell you I'd take the job. Someone you you'd take the job, no? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's all you wouldn't want it at the moment, Geoffrey. It's the very time to take it when the country's in trouble. If you want to be Prime Minister of your country, you better be willing to take it when the country's in trouble. I once asked Margaret Thatcher whether she'd rather be President of the United States or President of Russia? Russia, she said, Jeffrey. And I said, why have you chosen Russia, Prime Minister? And she said, so much more to do. That's it. When there's a job to be done, you have to do it. Uh, Jeffrey Archer, uh, the book is out now, next in line, uh, and it's the next uh, in this the series for you. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Ray, and thank you for having me. I always enjoy it. Cheers, coming sir. on your show. Stay Thank safe. You. All Thank the best. you so much. Cheers, cheers, Jeffrey. That was ominous, wasn't it? The eyebrows, with the iron lady saying that. For car insurance, van insurance, or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Yes, thank you very much, Joe. We're live here at Dublin Mail Centre right across the morning. We're going to be catching up with some of the team here on the ground as the stamp has gone digital. So we'll be finding out more on that in and around 8.45, another 10 minutes or so. Anyway, a quick look at weather, and it's quite a windy start. We're all talking about it out there this morning, fresh and gusty, locally strong at times there, southwest, very west. And in fact, that's status a wind warning remaining in place for those nine Atlantic coastal counties. Uh, until 12 o'clock later on today, so do be mindful if you're out about. Now, right across this afternoon, in fact, as that rain pushes in a northerly direction in behind us, we're going to see a vast towards the back end of the day. Those winds still pretty pacey, but not as strong as they are this morning. Top valleys of about 13, uh, 13 to 15 degrees. And finally then, tonight it'll all settle down. It'll be mainly dry and clear. A little bit of fog, some patchy mist as well as we edge across into your Tuesday morning. And quite a cold night in store with valleys back to about freezing to 5 degrees. So that's your weather for now. Come back to us live in and around 8.45. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. I'm sorry, I've got something in my eye. Oh no, did that just it's happen? A, now? It's, so sorry. it's a healthy one pot. Uh, one. A healthy one pot.
I can't read. You, it's a healthy one pot eye. option uh, in the kitchen this morning. You sort yourself out. Paul uh, Knapp. Contact lens. It's Paul over lens. to you. Good morning, guys. How are we all? Yes, yeah, so Good as you sir. said there, it's a one pot wonder. So we're making like a simple sausage stew, but we've switched the normal sausage to a plant based sausage. So it's like a dairy, a dairy free. It's a vegan sausage, if you want to call it that. Oh, okay. So it's, it's healthy, it's hearty, it's inexpensive. So a lot of these veggies and stuff like that, like the parsnips and the turnips and the carrots, they're all those like that, you know, like those 49 cents that you can get like in the supermarkets mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it isn't going to break the bank. So it's something that's really kind of cheap and inexpensive to make. And I suppose if you look at the weather that we've had this weekend and stuff like that, what I would say is if you was to make this at the weekend, it's something that you can kind of leave, just cook away and bubble away. You can go out, you can do lads matches, training and whatever it be. When you come back, this is cooked. Light the fire, get the blanket, put the movie on and sit there with a bowl, with a spoon and just eat this. It's like but a cuddle, wholesome. it's like a hug in a bowl, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Hard and wholesome. Is it so it's suitable for a slow cooker, obviously? Oh, absolutely, you can just yeah. slow cook it, you can cook it on the stove, you can cook it in the oven, you can do whatever you want to do. All of the ingredients up on Island M's Facebook page as well as Virgin Media One's website. But what we do is we start off with a nice hot pan and we're going to put into that is some onion and we're going to put in there some carrot and we're going to put in there some celery. So if you think about it, right, the traditional kind of mix for every stew kind of across the world is always going to be, oh, there's a spoon, we don't need that, is always going to be onions, celery and carrot, yep. okay? That's the base of every stew. And all we're going to do is we're going to be cooking this off for probably about five to six minutes. And what we want is we want that to kind of brown a little bit but not burn, okay? Yep. My mum loves burning stuff, but this is brown. The browning is going to aid to the colour and it's going to aid to the flavour as mm. well. You all need to, I'm drawing you in now like this, you it know what I mean? It's a good smell. So, listen, I suppose like stews, we all grow up with them, like our mums are making them and stuff like that and our grandmothers are making a stew. So it's one of those kind of real familiar smells. So once that starts to brown off, that would be for five to six minutes. I'm going to put in there some herbs. So I'm putting in there some fresh rosemary that I cut out my garden there yesterday, some fresh bay leaves that were from the garden. Oh. And then I've got some thyme. My thyme was a little bit kind of woody looking. It was more for radio than it was for TV. It was kind of a little bit bare looking. <laughs> so I've got some fresh thyme and a little bit of mixed herb. So you can use fresh herbs and you can use dried herbs. You can just use dried, use whatever you can get and whatever you can afford at the end of the day, okay? okay. So we're going to put that in there. And now you're going to get a glass of that rosemary. About four or five cloves of garlic goes into here as well. And again, you can put in as much garlic as you want. And what we would do now is we would start to cook that out again for about another five or six minutes and it starts to sweat down, it starts to reduce. All those flavours start to meet each other, OK? Lovely. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pop in there is a glass of red wine. Would you call that a glass of red wine? A small glass. <laughs> a small glass of red wine. I was like, don't ask the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> a glass of red wine goes into that. <laughs> that way. <laughs> and what we're doing is we are creating like a reduction. So we're going to reduce that and reduce that. We're going to yeah. reduce it down by half. So it really it intensifies those flavours, OK? All right, so once that goes in there, we're going to leave that bubble down and bubble down. As we said, we're using these, which are plant-based sausages. Yeah, okay? now, uh, where did you get these? Oh, Any supermarket. All right, OK, all right, vegan so sausages. They're vegan sausages, plant-based sausages and stuff like that, all right? So... I suppose we're looking at like a meatless Monday. We're looking at how we can, yeah. I suppose, if we switch out meat maybe once or twice a week, how that's good for the planet, that's good for ourselves and stuff like that, all right? Um, and sausages, I suppose, are a good one to transition with because they look like the sausage, they taste like the sausage, and it behaves like a sausage at yeah. the end of the day, okay. all right? And all I've done is I've just cut, cut these into chunks because, I suppose, lazy, washing up and all these bits and pieces, I want this to be a one pot, one spoon, in you go, yeah. kind of a job. Whereas yeah. you, could, you could have them whole. It's up to yourself, okay? okay? And you're going right. to boil these, are you? Boil them. Would you seal them first? You can like... seal them, you can put okay. them in, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't really matter, to be perfectly honest. But oh, it does and... matter, though, because... You like a bit, you'd be like a well, little bit of colour is, on the you know, skin. This is the thing, and I'm from the west of Ireland, this coddle business is just... You're not no, a coddle I person. I, I, I couldn't. I can't, You're okay. I, I can't. I boil sausage. You're I just, getting the sweats. I just, I, do you know? <laughs> well, do you know what you can do? But you can you, seal it then before you put you it can. in, I guess. You can. Yeah. You can. Of course you can. Yeah. You can seal it. You can do it with your onions. You can do. You can put it in at that stage. You can brown it off. Right. Yeah. Okay. Again, there's no real, real rules in cooking as such, or there shouldn't be rules. Do what you like. If you like it that way, do it that way. Yeah. If you like and it And how do the plant ones hold up then in terms of frying? Then? Exactly the same. Oh really? Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. That's why I say they behave really like a sausage at the end of the day. Okay. There's different types. Again, it's like you've got your own favourite sausage, so you pick the plant-based sausage. You have to try a few of them. So I like this one better than the other one. OK, into that, then we're going to put in some parsnip and we're also going to put in there some turnip. So we're making this nice and kind of packed full of veggies. Oh, and into that, are. we're going to put in there some flavouring. So I've got a tablespoon of paprika and then there's a couple of little cheats that I put into there. Right? Obviously, tomato puree, which goes normally into most kind of stews. I'm putting in there a decent kind of a tomato ketchup. All right, because there's loads of reductions of flavours in ketchups and then some traditional brown sauce. So, you know, like your YR sauce or something like that. Lob that in there. That goes into that. We're going to stir all this in. OK. And then we just let that all come together and already that brown sauce is kind of giving it its colour. You're getting that reduction going on with your red wine. And then all we do is we get a veggie stock and we're going to cover this with veggie stock. So if you've got about that much of vegetables, yep. yeah. cover it again. And what I mean, because we're going to reduce this down, we're going to reduce this down, we're going to reduce this probably for about 45 minutes to an hour 
And as we reduce this down, what's going to happen is it's also going to start to thicken itself. So we turn that up to full volume there, and we're going to let that bubble away. And what we will get at the end of that is we'll get this lovely, as I say, it thickens itself, OK? So what you've got is loads of veggies, loads of sausages. And what I've done is I've served that then with a little bit of a buttery, creamy mashed potato. OK, so there's butter in there and cream in there, but it's plant based at the end of the day. OK. And I've given you an alternative to mashed potatoes, which is a puree cauliflower. Steam All cauliflower, right. steam the cauliflower, blitz it up with some butter, some nutmeg, salt and pepper, and it's an alternative to mashed potato. About 30% less calories. Mm. And low, much lower carb. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, its consistency is completely it's different. It's much lighter as well. Yeah, you you go kind of right. Into, yeah, you yeah, really do. Yeah, yeah. There's a lovely taste off of that, off the cauliflower. Mmm. Mmm. Mm. That is nice. It is nice, yeah. And it's really simple. And again, it's way less, it's way less heavier than potato. And you can sit there and you like that, don't you? That's very nice. It is. It's really simple to do as well. As Warren mentioned, the slow cooker option is a great idea. You throw it on, leave it for the day, leave it. Absolutely. For and when hours. you come back, especially sort of a weekend, yep. uh, it's, it's great food that works around your family life and stuff like that. So if you want to go out, walk the dog, go for a walk, take the kids for a walk and stuff like that, there's nothing nicer than coming back when you get that kind of stew. And I suppose to have a plant based or vegan stew that's kind of going to go up for, say, like your grandma's or your mum's stew, but uh -huh. you're getting all of those rich, deep flavours that are in there. Yeah, even if you're doing a veg stew, that's really delicious. Well, thank you very much. That it sounds surprised. Absolutely. Deli I, I, I never get it. They, never, really, they I? never give me any of the food in the kitchen. <laughs> Lads have it all eaten. Yeah. I don't get to taste any. Paul Knapp, the firefighting chef, thank you so much, much for joining us this morning. Yeah. Cheers. It's gorgeous. Right, after the break, how does the new digital stamp from OnPost work? Derek will be finding out very shortly on Ireland AM. <laughs> Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. Post has unveiled a new digital stamp to make posting letters and parcels hassle-free. Our very own man from Aaron this morning, Derek, is at on Post's e-commerce campus to find out more. Modern va, Derek? I am indeed. Good morning, guys. Well, our beloved small little stamp is having a big modern makeover as we hit October 2022. But before we get into all the technology and the digital side of it, Sarah, good morning to you. Sarah, a busy morning here at the Mail Centre. Always very busy here at the Mail Centre in the mornings. Yeah, we have 1.6 million letters that come out every single day and that number can double or treble coming up to Christmas time. So the digital stamp really is coming at a great time. Um, and in fact, we're actually quite late here this morning. We are. We wouldn't make very good post people. We're coming in late to our shift. Uh, but yeah, like the post people have already all gone out delivering letters and parcels all over the country. And that is what the great thing is about the digital stamp is that it's really marrying the digital technology that we live by, but also the personal touch of getting a handwritten card or a letter uh, to your front door. And that's the brilliant thing about it. Now, over 500 people working here in the mail centre. It's very busy, isn't it? Extremely busy. So, uh, you know, Everyone is always flat on that, and that's only, as I said, going to get even busier coming up to Christmas time. So that's why the digital stamp is absolutely brilliant because it doesn't matter if you're in a time crunch or, you know, like the younger generation, we're super, super busy, uh, mightn't get, ti get time to go down to the post office, and that'll just increase coming up to Christmas time. So now we can get our digital stamp uh, on our phones and we don't even need to be nipping down to the post office. And, sir, the post office, as you mentioned, in every nook and cranny of the country, it really is the lifeline, the lifeblood of, of many communities, rural communities especially. For sure. We have 5,000 post boxes all over the country. Uh, so, you know, there probably is one at the end of your road. Uh, so, you know, that's the great thing is uh, you can just pop your digital stamp uh, on your envelope and then just pop it in a post box. Uh, so it really is so, so handy. And coming up to Christmas, very busy as well. Oh, my God, that is our busiest time of year, uh, you know, we're sending Christmas cards, Christmas presents abroad, all over the country. Uh, you know, so it really is coming at a great, great and time. And I got my Christmas cards the other day. Oh, you're very organised. <laughs> I am very organised. Now, the man behind all the technology here is Des. Tell us about how it actually works, Des. And can we just remind viewers at home that the little stamp is still alive and kicking. It's not going anywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, very much so. We love stamps and on post, and so absolutely. This is a complimentary product uh, that we see that offers customers real convenience. I suppose if you don't have a stamp on you or if it's difficult to get to a post office to pick up a stamp, this is an alternative solution. So how does the technology actually work on this then? Sure. Well, it is a new piece of technology that we've developed. Um, essentially, it enables customers to send an item anywhere in the Republic of Ireland uh, without the need for a physical stamp. 
Uh, in its place, uh, you can get a 12-digit code, which is available from the OnPost app. And essentially, you download the OnPost app. Uh, you go through the process of selecting which particular size of envelope you're sending. Um, obviously, then you select uh, uh, your payment method. And then once you actually complete that task, you'll be then presented with a 12-digit alphanumeric code, okay. which you then write onto an envelope. Into the corner. In, exactly, exactly. Okay, so I have a little question for you here. So if it's yeah. raining, for example, and the ink starts to run, or, for example, Mary down in Port Leash, you know, we can't read her writing, for example. What yeah. happens in yeah. that situation then? Well, first of all, we do obviously ask the customers make sure that their handwriting is as legible as possible. Okay. Uh, should there be any difficulty with it, I mean, we have some very high-level high, uh, high level technology here uh, that enables us to read all these uh, stamps and make sure that they're valid and so on. If for whatever reason we can't read that, we have a process whereby we're able to look at that and make sure that it's valid and then send it on its way. Okay, so before we let you go, what do you prefer now, the old little stamp or the new digital well, code? <laughs> I have to say, um, the real benefit of the digital stamp, which is true, uh, untrue for the, post, uh, the regular postage stamp, is that you get notification when the item has been delivered. Okay. And so that's a really nice feature, that if you send your item, um, we'll pass it on through, our postal operators will scan it when it comes to mm. the door, and then obviously customers now, will the end price, up the old stamp is 125, this is two euro. Correct. It's a bit correct. of a hike, a bit of a tight squeeze at the correct. moment. Correct. Well, essentially it does pay for the postage, the regular postage uh, uh, elements, but it has that added feature of the convenience of being able to get it on your smartphone there and then. Okay. Uh, but also we also check all the, uh, the digital stamps at the end of the process, scan them, and then we notify the customer that it's arrived. Okay. So it's a really nice feature that we think so is, uh, is nice good value sense. for money. Okay, uh, Sarah, for you, the digital stamp or the old digital stamp? Oh my gosh, that is such a hard question. Obviously, our traditional stamps are so beautiful and, like, you know, there are many pieces of art. But I think, you know, going uh, forward, because I am such a... I'm biased. <laughs> I am biased, stamp. but it would be the digital stamp for, for me. For me, guys, it's the traditional stamp. On post.com for more information, back to you guys in the studio. I love the old Deserves stamps. to be on a stamp someday. If we get rid of all the stamps, Derek will never be on a stamp. Unless it'll be an NFT code. Derek the digits. Derek the Derek's, digits. Derek's digits. Derek's digits. That would Two be... euro is a bit of like, I suppose if you're going to, if you want the confirmation back and you want the, the ease of use of, you do need to write all the digits down then? I just wonder how people who like work in post offices are like, oh lads, come on. We like giving out our stamps. Give us something. I don't know. What do you make of it? 96 if you want to let us know. I haven't gotten the text here. I forgot to open them. Uh, we were chatting earlier on about 150 million being paid out in compensation around Ireland from councils because people have tripped oh, yeah. over the footpaths. And Noel says, my husband fell into a pothole in Bantry and he broke his hip. Uh, and he broke his hip and... No he, compensation, she And says. they got absolutely no, no compensation on that one. Um, geez, Noel, I'm so, I'm so so sorry, but God, that's absolutely mad. Um, there's loads more messages in here. We were talking about... Uh, uh, texts and parking and bonfires as well. Loads of memories on bonfires. I tell you what, we'll come back to the text. You can keep coming. The number again? 089. Thank you. Six. 089 6 triple one triple one. She's been on a week's holiday. She's forgotten that's, the text message that's already. That's it. So let us know. Still to come, acclaimed writer Michael Harding joins us to chat about his latest memoir, Love, Michael Harding, plus West End star Michael Ball talks reteaming with Andrew Lloyd Webber. Love, Michael Ball. Uh, and if all that wasn't enough, we'll be hearing from Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. We're back with you in just a few minutes on Ireland AM. Welcome back to Ireland AM. There is lots more on the way between now and 10, isn't there, Ray? Is there? There's, you've got more work isn't to do. Great. Double clapping. Uh, coming up this hour, they were back home for the Irish premiere of their new movie, Banshees of Inishirin. And uh, we'll be hearing from Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson in a few minutes. A uh, celebrated writer. I could just listen to him all day long. Michael Harding will be here to talk about his most personal work to date. And he's Mr. Showbiz from Eurovision to Broadway. Michael Ball will be here to talk about a life on stage and his new gig as a writer of fiction. And I'm hearing there's brand new breaking news in the world of fashion. It's all about neutral tones. Isn't that right, Lorna Waitman? It is. This morning we are going to talk about ways to wear neutral tones in a very practical manner because I fear people will not know what to do with camel tones, beiges. How do you wear them without getting dirty all day? I'm going to share some nice tips and tricks with some designer inspo as well. <laughs> My trousers are wrecked and I've only had them on since 7am and I've been inside, so yes.
looking forward to You cope pretty well with camel, camel tones, <laughs> don't you? Uh, yeah. Uh, Derek, before we hear what today's weather has in store, what was it like? What, tell us, what was it like meeting Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson? Do you know what, Ray? I walked the red carpet the other uh, evening, and not my usual habitat now, I have to say. Normally, I'm out in the wind in the rain. Stop. But I got to glam up for one night only. Uh, but you know what? I didn't glam up too much because I wore my iron sweater on the red carpet all the way from the Iron Islands with the Banshees of Edishirn, and the boys loved it. The first thing Colin Farrell said to me, love the curls, love the iron sweater. Boom. There you go. He knows how to reel them in. Just casting a line and reeling them in. Uh, looking forward to that, Derek. We'll be looking at it very shortly. For car insurance, van insurance, or home insurance, call the Quote Devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Yes, thanks, Joe. We're live here, Knockbit in Dublin 12, right across the morning. We've got the In Bruges duo back together again. Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson for the red carpet of the Banshees of Inishirn. That's all to come in the next few minutes. A quick look at weather opening past 9 o'clock here this morning, and everyone really is talking about the wind because it is quite strong out there this morning. In fact, we still have that status yellow wind warning in place for those nine counties now, including Cork, Harry, Clare, into parts of Galway, Mayo, through Leitrim, Sligo, and County Donegal. That remains in place until 12 o'clock this afternoon. Mean speed 50 to 65 kilometres per hour, gusts in excess of 90 to 110. So if you are driving, especially right up and down those Atlantic coastal counties, a lot of crosswinds driving pretty tricky out there this morning, so do take extra care. So after that wind warning is lifted from 12 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to see an improving picture and in fact as that rain clears in a northerly direction in behind it, we're going to see some nice bright spells. So a nice improvement towards the back end of the day. Winds still on the pacey side, but easing off as they veer to the west. Top temps of about 13 to 15 degrees. Finally then tonight, the good news is that it will all settle down, mainly dry, calm and clear. We will see some patchy mist and a taster of fog as well. That will feed its way into your Tuesday morning. And quite a cold, quite a chilly night in store. So get your Gansies on, stay nice and cosy with values back, but freezing to 5 degrees. So that's your weather for now. We've got that interview from the red carpet coming to you in a few moments' time. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Now that not only is Derek the star of the show, but that jumper is the star of the show because he used it to reel in the major celebrities for the premiere of the new film from the team behind... In Bruges. Thank you. In F in Bruges. Uh, he's like Foster and Allen in the posting centre this morning. Uh, <laughs> Such a good jumper. He must have been sweating if he was inside in that. Well, we'll check premiere. it out. He, uh, Derek caught up with Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson and writer-director Martin McDonough to talk all about the new movie, The Banshees of Inish Colin, Sonny, Larry. Didn't you and he used to be the best of friends? We're still the best of friends. No, you're not. Who says we're not? Sit somewhere else. <laughs> Well, it's a dark comedy movie set off the west coast of Ireland that sees acting legends Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell reunited since in Bruges 2008. Now, directed by award-winning director Martin McDonough, The Banshees of Inishirn is already tipped for Oscar glory. We're on the red carpet, we've got the passes, let's go meet the cast and crew. Now, if I've done something to you, just tell me what I've done to you. When you didn't do anything to me, I just don't like you no more. Did you like me yesterday? about the, the Irish humour, what is it about the dark comedy that draws Irish people to that kind of humour? You'd have to laugh or you'd, or you'd go yeah, mad. To laugh, to laugh. <laughs> the absurdities of life and in the face of pain, you have to at least be looking at the absurdity and looking at the pain. Do you know what I mean? So it's not, it's a good thing, you know? Not that you're saying it's anything but. But um, I think we do, like we have, whether we, whether we admit it or not, I'm not saying that we're preoccupied with it, but you know, we're known for our funerals, not just our weddings. Well, do you know what I mean? Be, there's an interesting thing about that, though, because a lot of this has to do with expression and male inability to express feelings, which doesn't really exist love in this you. film. Yeah. Love you back. And it's like, it doesn't really exist in this thing, but it does actually allow you, the dark side, it allows you to confront the dark side. In a way, the funerals we go and you talk about a fella's life and you laugh a lot, uh, but also there's, a re there's real grieving and catharsis because you're facing it. Yeah, exactly. So it's not necessarily that the humour is dark. Yeah. It's that... This whole, this whole thing is ludicrous, but at least it's faced. Right, let's talk about the on-screen chemistry between the two of you. We have a good friendship off, but that doesn't guarantee an awful lot, other than the fact uh, nice, that nice once we Nice lunch breaks. That's all that guarantees. That's all it guarantees, but it 
but we had three weeks rehearsal to get the obstructions out of the way. We understood where we were going with it. So you know when you go down a particular route, if something happens in a take, that, that Colin or the, any of the rest of the class, the cast, in fact, are right there with you. You're going down the hill in, in the same toboggan. And whatever way it takes, you can go there. So it has something to do with that freedom, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, totally. And, and to be able to work with people and have a, a almost a sense of uh, comfort in your uncertainty where you're not trying to because yeah. for me a big part of the whole process of doing this job for a living and all is there's massive amounts of uncertainty man <laughs> I mean it and so to not have to waste energy hiding that uncertainty and to be able to go in and say I have no f clue what we're doing uh, but I'm glad we're all here yeah. trying to figure it out together and feel that simpatico with everyone else and that's what day one of rehearsal we had a three week rehearsal period on this and on In Bruges and those that's a luxury as well you never get in film Martin insists on that Martin this movie set in the west of Ireland what brought you out to go in? Um, well, uh, Dad's from Galway, Mum and Dad live there uh, now, and um, so I started off there with Druid Theatre in, uh, in 1995, I think it was. I've always had a film that's for Galway town and, and, and the county, um, and I always love the Aran Islands too. I love the scenery around there. Uh, and all the way up through Sligo and Mayo too, we filmed on Ackle. Um, yeah, it's just like a beautiful part of the world and uh, hasn't been captured a lot on, on film, I think, so that was part of it too. Do you know who we remember for how nice they was in the 17th century? Who? Absolutely no one. Yeah, we all remember the music at the time. Everyone to a man knows Mozart's name. I don't, so there goes that theory. She's a bit of sure God, they're it's... so charming, aren't they? Oh, they're unbelievable. Now, Colin's looking fantastic. Actually, Brendan's looking fantastic as well. They're both looking great. 15 minutes standing ovation, by the way. Wouldn't you just be like, oh, I'd stop it. I'm I need to sit down. Um, sit down. It's out this weekend. His new book has been called Powerful and Profound. We speak to author Michael Harding next. Our next guest is a celebrated author. He's a minstrel, a modern-day bard and a stand-up philosopher. He joins us now in studio to discuss his most personal work to date, All the Things Left Unsaid. Please welcome Michael Harding. Uh, Michael, thanks so much for joining us this morning. All the Things Left Unsaid. Uh, and I suppose after all these years, you, you, one would think that you've... <laughs> I've said enough. <laughs> that you, well, that, you, that, you've, that you've said plenty. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 we'll, we'll come to the book in just a moment. Um, Moran was just, just asking a moment ago, how are you? How are you feeling? Because uh, health-wise, you've been up and down. Yeah, I, I had two difficult years. I was in Beaumont twice for procedures, as they call them now, operations uh, on the spine. Uh, not on an artery within the spine. And... Uh, I suppose it could have killed me or it could have left me in a wheelchair. And so I'm walking around and I'm perfect. And I feel that was the trauma. I mean, the past 10 years I've been through a whole lot of mechanical problems with my health. But this one was the big one because I really felt I'm, I'm 69 years of age. Yeah. And if this doesn't finish me off, something else will. And I got a, a real sense of, you know, I'm crossing a threshold here about ageing, that it's, I'm no longer a middle-aged man having a few operations. This is like you're 69 years of age, something very serious goes wrong with you, and it makes you think about the shortness of life. And then it makes you feel kind of hugely grateful to be alive. Yeah, to right. come through it. And like I, I feel at the minute I'm leaping out of my skin because I'm sitting here talking to ye. But there was a moment last year where I was contemplating that I'd never be sitting here again. So it was, so, so this, because I can't even pronounce what it was an MRI and you had an issue with your spine, as you said. But yeah. It was, was it like a, a short, sharp kick to the head that altered your reality sort of a thing? Even yeah. though you had been through so much yeah, well, health-wise from colitis and depression, yeah, and, you know, heart yeah, issues. Yeah. This was the one that kind of went... This was the one that I really, like... I was beginning to fall, so the muscles in my body were, were dying off, or they feel, felt like they were dying. Yeah. And so my whole gut, everything below the belly, was going, like, really numb, and it felt like you have a very serious illness. And if they didn't have MRIs, 
they wouldn't have been able to find it. Yeah. Like if that happened 20 years ago or 15 years ago, I would just have to deteriorate until I was gone. So you were, it was, you were declining? So, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's, they did the MRI, they found whatever they the found, issue was. They found, it was called, if I'm right now, I may be wrong, an arteriovenal fistula, which meant that the, the artery in the spine was sending all the blood in the wrong direction. Okay. And that right. wasn't going to That's not... that wasn't going to last. No. Right. <laughs> they, they they did an MRI. They said you need to get up here to Beaumont like immediately. Yeah. And I said like, do you mean next Monday? And they said no, we mean tonight. Wow. It was a Friday evening, and they said no, no, get up tonight and we'll do this in the morning. And how long were, how long did it take for you to be sorted out? Well, they did that in October of I think 2020. Yeah. And uh, so I was about two or three weeks in hospital, but. The attempt they made to fix the artery didn't work. And so by about February, I had deteriorated really badly. And that was during COVID. Yeah. So I was terrified that if I got COVID, I'd be really in trouble. And they brought me back in in March for about three weeks again and did a, a bigger job where they kind of manually went through the spine to find the artery and, and fix it. There was, yeah. there was one amazing moment. You know, you know the little cod liver oil tablets? Yeah. yeah. At one stage before the operation, they got about 30 of them on a long piece of tape. And they sell the tape, the tape to my spine at the back. And I said, what's that for? And it was, it was to x-ray it so that they'd know where they were going when they went in. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, God. That, that the little kind of markings they made would actually be on the x-ray so that they'd be able to see where we're not going into the wrong spot. And the spine. And, and what can you say about that except the technology, yeah. the quality of the doctors, the quality of the surgeons, the quality of the nursing staff in that whole system mm -hmm. that was available to me when I needed yeah. it. When I, consider... I would be forever grateful to the doctors, nurses and everybody catering in Beaumont that I'm here. I'm sitting that's here. That's it, yeah, you, you walk in. You I walk, walk in. Join, join. <laughs> yeah, that's it, you yeah, walked in yeah. and you, you're, you're full of life, vim and vigour. Yeah. So then when you say then, all the things left unsaid, you are, you're, a new, you're a different man, a new man well, compared to the man that you were before you went into the hospital. I suppose in a way I am, in yeah. a way I'm not. I mean, I mean, it's just another book in one sense. But there was a, when I came out of the hospital, I felt I needed to be alone to think of the sense of trauma. I was like, I had a cat one time in Mullingar, right? And my little cat got hit by a, a car. And she came into the house, and I, know, I knew there was something wrong because her tail was falling down, her tail was gone dead. Uh -huh. And she went into the kitchen and found a corner of, of a press. And she went in there, and she stayed in there for about four days. And then she came out and she was okay. Yeah. And I felt, I need to do the same thing. I need to go away and be alone and heal and feel like, how is this trauma of illness affecting me yeah. at my age? And I didn't plan the book, but the, you know, all the things that are left unsaid is, is the matter, the thing that matters to you, that you never said to somebody, that you regret that you didn't say, in a relationship or in a friendship or with your children, like with your parents, maybe they pass away and you feel, you know, I, there was things I never really said to her. I never told her how much I loved her, whatever. And I got flooded with that. I got flooded with a sense of, you know, friends who had died. Tom Hickey, great actor. Bernard Lachlan from Anna McCarrig. Mary McPartland, a great singer. These were people that I, I was close to, I loved. Pat O'Brien, a great priest in the west of Ireland. But they died. And when they died, it was like there was so much that I had not said to them. Yeah. There was so much love that I hadn't shared with them. And, and I just, it was like, it was like their ghosts came into the house. I was in this house in Donegal on my own. And it was like their ghosts came into the house. And I'd look at them and I'd think, I, I, I want to write you a letter. I want to say to you what I didn't say. Yeah. I want to apologise to you for, for what I should have apologised for. You know, when I didn't go and visit you in the hospital and I feel bad about it. So it was that kind of book. It, it just... All the things that, that I never said to yeah. people. And, and I suddenly wanted to say them. And there were these people were people that are, have passed on, you know. Do you know what's beautiful and profound there? Mm. Is that often in the heat of a moment, you can be sitting down and you're going, why didn't I say that? As yeah. a retort to yeah. someone. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the I should have said that. I should have said that. Yeah. Yeah. Should have said yeah. that. And it, it's always sort of it in the heat of the moment. But it burns you up. 
But, but yours is also positive. It's, or is there negative in there that I wish no, I told? It's no, all I, about I love think and joy. Not, except, except there's one letter which I wrote to one of... Do you know the, the dead babies that lie in tune? Sure. Yeah. There was one... Something Catherine Corliss said to me about those babies, and they came, like, alive to me. And I felt I should speak... Somebody should say... Somebody should apologise to them, too that they haven't been buried yet, you know? Mm. So it, th there was nothing negative that I wanted to say. And the fact of the matter is that mostly with people, what you really regret is the negative things you said. Yeah. yeah. You, you regret the negative things you said, but you also regret the positive things you didn't say. And what you really wanted to say. It's, it's just amazing how much negative things we say. And, and the, the positive we really feel about people, and we end up not saying it. That is such the perfect way to think about this. And if you read any of Michael's books and his columns in the, in the Times, you know how we can really get you. It's the brand new book, All the Things Left Unsaid, Confessions of Love and Regret. And Michael's actually, you've done the audio book, so it'll be gorgeous yes. to listen to it in your voice. Michael Harding, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so pleasure. much. Yeah. Thank yes, you sir. so much. Love to see you. Thank you. Welcome back. It's all about wearing neutral tones in fashion this morning. Stylist Lorna Waitman joins us now. Hello. Good morning. Neutral. So are we talking beige? We're talking beige, <laughs> caramel, honey, brown, chocolate. All of those colours. Yeah, I know. You can go the full spectrum. So you think about it, it's kind of light to dark in the colour spectrum. OK. So I would consider they were all kind of neutral tones. But the way to look at it is that the head-to-toe look was definitely an autumn-winter catwalk trend, which we'll see in a minute. But I think it's not a very practical way to, to wear the colour. So it's about breaking it up and using it and those particular shades as foundation colours that you can add to. And that makes them so much easier to wear. Yeah, because when you're looking on Pinterest, you're like, that person took that photo and then they spilled that coffee all over them. Like, I'm sorry, girl, but there's no way you're keeping it clean. <laughs> they did, or they got changed. They got changed <laughs> immediately into something darker. OK, our first inspiration today is from the Michael Kors catwalk. Yeah, so Michael Kors did this, this really, really lovely kind of muted tone catwalk look. So you'll notice that there's one kind of tone there. It's lovely. It's actually kind of off cream. It's actually not too dark a coat. Okay. But what they've done is, is added two kind of things, which are the over the knee boots, leather look leggings, and you've got a bit of print in the bag. So we've got a couple of different things that are just making that lighter shade easier to wear. So we're being inspired by that yes. look and how we kind of build that look ourselves. So for we've Quiva, got this, yeah. for Quiva is wearing this gorgeous camel coat, which I think is just such a staple piece. If you look at even designers like Max Mara that make that kind of style of coat yes. all the time, it's very, very expensive. This is how you get the look for less, which I love. But we're breaking up that color with that print underneath it. So you'll notice it actually creates a very nice balanced uh, outfit. Yeah, There's a bit of contrast it does. there. But also those two pieces can be worn completely independently of each other to create two other looks, which I love as well. And then you'll notice as well, we've got this little split in the dress itself and we put an over the knee boot with that. So you get a little bit more coverage, but you got a little bit of skin there too, which I really, really like. So we're definitely getting that inspired Because when you're look. doing that with the boots, you want to show it off. You don't want to be wanna hiding. Show it off. Exactly, exactly. And then the bag has a very, very lovely designer feel. I'll let you guess the designer as well. <laughs> That's really well done. It's not a fake well Chanel. Done. It is a very, very good one. That's from Aldo, which is available from uh, in Dundrum Town Centre. These, This look is from Penny's and it's in store now. But I feel like these are two independent pieces that you'll get a lot of wear out for plenty of seasons to come. Weaver, thank you for that. Our next look is going to be inspired by Burberry. Burberry. Now, when you say Burberry, we think of one particular thing and that's the trench coat, which yes. they are so well known for. Now, their trench coats always command a very high price. They're, it's Burberry. You've got this real, real high-end designer feel to that. Yeah. And they make so many different styles of them as well. So we're taking inspiration from that particular catwalk look and we've brought it back to make it a very simple, easy to style look. But I actually think this is one that will translate to office wear as well. So this 
trench I absolutely love. It's from Friday's Edit. And what's really different about it is the little cuff sleeve. You've got this beautiful cut down the back as well. Now I've tied the belt behind yeah. the trench to give it a little bit more cinched in effect just with a little bow as well. I always have a nightmare trying to tie the back. Well <laughs> done. Someone else thank to do you it. for the inspiration. I think you need someone else to do it. But it's really lovely and really beautifully well cut. And we've put a little crew neck top underneath that. So I love a darker shade with a neutral mm. tone because it does make it very easy to wear as well. And they're very classic staple pieces in your wardrobe. So you can even swap out the printed animals a print skirt that I have here. You could do that with jeans as well. You could do it with a pair of black trousers. You can make that look your own in so many different ways. But I love the pleated effect of this skirt. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And then I put a little chunky boot with it as well just to dress it up a bit with a patent contrast, which I particularly You're squeaking like. this morning, Kirsten, in the boots. <laughs> They're definitely a squeaky <laughs> boot. They need a little bit of breaking in. But yes. it's about the, the trench coat, which I think is a really great piece to have. And again, they are just timeless. They keep coming back over and over in different iterations as they well. They do. I loved the boots and I have to say for me about the childish. <laughs> so Amelia Wickstead is our, our third inspiration here today. Yes. Oh, that's a great suit. Isn't this a great suit? Tailoring has just had a bit of a renaissance. Um, Amelia Wick said, in case you're not familiar with her, is a, a Kate Middleton favourite, London-based designer. Very good at making classic pieces look very different every season. So she went for this tonal look, which is the two shades matched together with a different tone of a mutual shade underneath, underneath. it to make it a bit more practical. So we're going back to pennies for this look as well and going a little darker with the suit colour, which is like a, like a light chocolate brown, which I think is so, so chic and a really nice departure from the classic black or navy suit that you might tend to go for. Yes. And I've broken it up as well then by just having, you've got the shirt, you've got a little preppy sweater vest. It's very preppy. It. It's very it's cute. Very preppy. It's very, very preppy. But it's funny when, if you were to take the sweater vest off and you just have the plain white shirt yeah. and you did it with a nice court shoe, you've got a really nice formal workwear look. Yeah. But this is just making a little bit more edgy and very Instagrammable at the moment as well. This is such an Instagram streetwear trend. It's making everything look a bit preppy. And if you wear it with like a bralette, if you're willing to go that far oh, and close lovely. it, yes. put a little tip, that's gorgeous for an Absolutely edit. Absolutely gorgeous. Or you could potentially just close the jacket over entirely and wear it as a top, which I love as the well. The trousers are great because Audrey, you are tall and they're they're good. They're good trousers for a flat shoe. So ideally, not all trousers, like let's say tailoring, is designed to always wear with the heel. But no. I also I also feel like I don't like dressing with the assumption that you have to wear a heel every gotcha. time you put on a pair of trousers. So these ones are a really great one for that. They're great. We're going back to Michael Kors for our last inspiration. Oh, yes. sweet lord. This is a very over the top Michael Kors look, but I absolutely love it. But one of the things that the New York catwalks did very well was this, do you know what? We're ready to go out. Let's dress up and have fun yeah. on the catwalk, which I particularly like. But what way we want to bring that in is how do you wear that look every day or at the weekend or when you're just popping out to meet your friends. So this is a really lovely coat. It's a very, very soft faux fur. So it's a very fine um, woven fabric. So you'll notice it's not as, you know, thick and, yeah. you know, full of volume like a lot of dressy faux furs would be. Okay. So we're dressing it down a little and bit. And it's that aviator style, which is yes, back, very big really again this back. year. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, if you didn't want to go for the leather look in that, this is a great option. And then we put a printed dress with it again, but we're back to that chunkier over the knee boot as well. Now these are a little bit chunky as well so if you want to kind of really go down that footwear trend these are from Aldo you can have a look at them but I'm balancing it out with something quite classic as well. Just a little tote handbag to carry around which I think is really lovely but it's what this trend is really about is taking all the aspects of catwalk and bringing them into day to day yeah. looks and how how do I make it my own? Quiva you look so class in those boots I don't know if I carry them off she looked amazing in those Lord of Waitman as always thank you my for pleasure. our fashion masterclasses as always. Uh, now, Raymond, he's over there. Hello. I'd carry them off. You could carry off those boots. Yeah. I would love to see you Me doing a Neo. Me and Quaver are the only people in the studio that can wear those boots. Neo you. from the Matrix. I've got, Here a, we I've go. got a pair just like them. Uh, <laughs> now, move, moving on. Uh, he's one of the busiest men in showbiz and he can now add author to his CV. We'll be meeting Michael Ball next.
You're very welcome back. Now, he's a musical theatre superstar that's dominated the stage and music charts. But now he's taking on the publishing world with his debut novel. It is a pleasure to say good morning to Michael Ball. Michael, how are you doing? Morning, both of you. How are you? I'm morning, fine. sir. Good to see you. Which one? Good to see you, too. Although I say it's good to see you, I can't actually see... There you there. are. We look much worse. Leave them off. <laughs> Leave them off. We look... We look Don't do that. <laughs> we look much worse. Michael, there are so many things to, to talk to you about, but let's get straight into it. You're publishing right. your debut novel. Ah, uh, oh, there it is. I know. There Beautiful. it is. What? I'm... Uh, I, it is beautiful. They've done a lovely job on the cover. I just hope inside is as good. Um, yeah, it's 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 my first foray into into writing, into uh, producing a novel. I've been asked loads of times if I'd be interested in doing a memoir, and I'm simply not. It just doesn't interest me. So I thought, you know, as a lot of us did during the last few years, what other artistic outlets are there? And I thought about. Uh, I started writing songs properly. And then I thought about writing a novel. You know, all of us read, I, I personally read voraciously. And I thought, you know, everyone says you have at least one decent novel inside you. Is it true? So I set about creating this world of The Empire, which is a, a fictional theatre in the north of England uh, in 1922. And the impetus for it, I think, was I, I go to, you know, with my job, I've travelled extensively around this country, around Ireland, around, around the world, and there are so many beautiful theatres, and all of them have their own personalities, all of them have their own stories, and all of them are populated by incredible characters. So I wanted to give the reader a sort of insight into the real world, backstage, the characters, the romances, the tensions, the excitement. And uh, so I've created this 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 world of the Empire. Man, man. Yeah, and I, I suppose they say right about what you know, and you certainly know, do know about theatre. When you mention a, a memoir, is, this an is, is using fiction an opportunity for you to tell all the stories that you want to tell about your friends without yeah. never hearing from them again? <laughs> <laughs> without 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 getting a lawsuit, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah, and and also things that have, have happened to me. Uh, characters in there reflect things that have happened to me, and also and I've met some amazing people along the way, and so interesting. And I'm talking about the people that work backstage, the in, in the wardrobe department, in the crews, in the the front of house, the directors, the other actors, and so on. And uh, no specific character is one person, but you might spot a couple. If Alan Hughes was here, he knows everything about the musical world. He'd be like, I bet you I know who that is. Bet you I know who that is. Bet you I know who that is. I bet Alan's in it. I bet it could be. It could be you in know it. what? I know will probably be right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so could this be an opportunity, you know, to translate something? Is there some day you'd be like, all right, Andrew Lloyd Webber, I'm doing my own musical. I'm not doing yours anymore. I'm writing the music. I'm doing the story. That would be really interesting, wouldn't it? Um, they take so long. I mean, a, a book, you're in control of it. You know, you, you sit down, you write, it's it, it, it's all yours. Um, musicals are very different, very difficult, a long, tortuous process. But I have toyed with the idea. I work with um, writing songs with an amazing singer-songwriter called Amy Wodge. She wrote the, uh, the British entry that did incredibly well at the Eurovision, you know, Spaceman that Sam Ryder did. And we've written together and we're toying with ideas. So you never know. But currently there is nothing in, in the thing. I th don't think Andrew needs to worry too much at the moment. Yeah, he, he's, uh, he's safe enough, yeah. Yeah, um, but you're the reason. You mentioned Eurovision there. And I think, you, can you put this on the dust jacket? I'm the reason for Riverdance. Yeah, I think I should. And you know I haven't had a penny from them. <laughs> no, it, it was because 1992 I did Eurovision and it was between me, famously between me and Linda Martin uh, as, as to who was going to win. She, of course, won. Some would say quite rightly. And because of that, it was uh, the Eurovision was hosted in, in, uh, in Ireland. And we all know what the, uh, the interval act was. So if I'd won and we'd had it in the UK, there would have been no river dance. That's it. This I... is my 
This is my contribution to the arts. Your legacy. Forget the novel. Your legacy <laughs> yeah. to the uh, your contribution is River. Well, 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 I suppose you should say that. Gone. Where's my money? What's on behalf on? of the Irish nation, Michael Ball. <laughs> Thank you. So, thanks for, for Riverdance. <laughs> giving. Giving is all I ever do, right? <laughs> <laughs> so generous. Uh, but, and we know also that you are, you have been going around, you went to Las Vegas yourself and Alfie Bo, you've got an album out, so you are doing everything. Yeah, a yeah, couple of weeks' time, um, we release our album together in Vegas. This is our fifth album. And uh, got, we, we, we came over, finally we were able to get to, to do some concerts in, in Ireland yeah. at the end of last year. I uh, can't wait to come back. So this, is, this, this album is kind of a uh, love letter to the city of Vegas, to uh, all the incredible artists that have uh, performed there. Alf took me over. I'd never been to Vegas. He knows it really well. So he took me there for two weeks. Two weeks is a long time to spend. In Vegas, <laughs> that's though, a just... <laughs> that's a long time. Will you give us one? Will you give us one? Love, love. changes everything. A love changes. A... Well, I'm going to be. You know, I'm going back into aspects of love next year. Ah! We're uh, yeah, seriously. Not as the young. This comes as a shock. Seventeen year old, but as the older character. <gasps> and I had this idea that that this would work. But the young character doesn't sing. Uh, the young character sings My Alex. Love, James. love, love changes love everything. Love changes everything. Michael oh, Ball. It it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Michael Ball. Thank you so oh, much. Man. Bye, Michael. Buy the book. Buy the Brand book. New the book. Empire. The Empire. Uh, we're back tomorrow from what? Is it, is it 7 o'clock in the Sorry, morning? 7 a.m. Touch you then. Bye. Have a lovely day.